Okay, thank you all for coming, and um, I'd like to thank uh, John for in, for inviting me and for organizing these uh, invited tutorials. This is a, a nice uh, new idea for ICRA, and uh, uh, seems to be going well given the amount of interest. Um, this uh, tutorial will be in four parts. Each part is uh, about 90 minutes, and um, so I'm going to talk from now, which is about 8:45, up until 10:15, and then we'll break for half an hour. Um, the first two parts are the are the the, the morning. And that will be just basic motion planning. So these will be the kinds of things that are in my book. Um, the second part, which is in the afternoon, is about dynamic environments. And so um, I will first, in, in that topic, we'll first cover modeling issues and then go into particular uh, methods, survey some of the current uh, methods in that area. So um, John sent mail to um, Robotics Worldwide and gave a list of topics. And motion planning for dynamic environments was the most popular on their list. So. Um, so after that, he invited me to give this tutorial, which I'm very happy about. Um, it's not my current research area in some sense. I have background in motion planning, but dynamic environments, I, I had to work hard to prepare this. I looked at a lot of the recent literature, tried to put together a good tutorial for you on, on the topic. So, um, so um, I, I wanted to cover what was uh, interesting by popular demand, and, and so I'll do my best today to, to do that. Um, and also, as John said, I have a book that's available online, and uh, I may refer to that at some, at some parts during my tutorial today. Um, also, between the, uh, the, the parts of my tutorial, I will have uh, homework assignments for you to do uh, during the, the breaks. And so uh, this will be like a real class, but uh, crammed into a single day, ICRA style. Right? So, um, all right, so let's get started. Yes, I use Linux. Um, let's see. Let's see if it crashes, right? And so that for the two parts on motion planning, the first part is going to just give some of the mathematical background in order to, I would say, think like a motion planning person. And um, I'm really assuming this tutorial starts with uh, people who do not have background in motion planning. So I'm really trying to start from the absolute basics and go through. Um, I see some people in the audience I know well, and they're quite experienced with motion planning. And uh, well, you might be a little bored. Maybe you'll learn something new. I don't know. Um, all right. <laughs> well, the basic path planning problem. Um, we want to get a robot from some initial configuration to some goal configuration. So that's the way the um, problem is formulated. There's some known obstacles um, that have been represented and given. We want algorithms that can compute a motion automatically. So this just shows some kind of basic solution um, to get the robot from one place to another. Really, it should look like a continuous animation. I want to know all of the intermediate transformations to apply to the robot. And it could be a simple rigid object. It could be a um, more complicated, like this PR2 robot here, um, doing manipulation, all sorts of things. So it could be a collection of moving bodies that are attached together in some way, um, or unattached moving bodies. Um, first part is geometric models. So one of the first things we have to do is describe the environment. So what we have for these problems, we have a robot and obstacles that live in a world or workspace. And that may be uh, R2 or R3, so we don't go any uh, dimensions beyond that because we don't have a four-dimensional robots or anything like that. We will get into some higher dimensional spaces, but it's important to keep in mind that the workspace or world for the robot is always 2D or 3D. Okay, 1D once in a while for some nice examples, but, but usually not. Um, inside of that, we have an obstacle region. Okay, I'll point with this. We have an obstacle region. That's pretty bright and blinding. Okay, let's see. I'll just go here like this. I like this. Um, so we have, we have an obstacle region. So it's some closed subset of the... Um, of the world or workspace, and we have a robot which is placed at some configuration Q. I'm going to go into all of the details of this, but I just want to say that that's um, the, the, the model at some level. So we have to represent this robot and we have to represent these obstacles. And um, here's the kinds of issues we tend to think about. Um, can we obtain this geometric representation automatically, right? So um, maybe you do a slam in this building here. Um, can you easily transform that into models that can be used for motion planning. Maybe it's easy, maybe it's hard, maybe it takes a certain amount of time. Um, what is the overall complexity of the representation? We care about that. We care about deciding on collision efficiently. And um, it, it may also become important to, um, to infer whether or not we're talking about a solid obstacle that has a very clear interior and exterior, or maybe it might become uh, difficult right, to, 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 to determine that. And that's, that'll become an issue with regard to geometric models. Um, so this is one way we, we often uh, start. 
we like to think about what are the primitives that are used to represent the obstacles, and this will ultimately have an impact on the different kinds of uh, motion planning algorithms um, that are used. So for example, um, suppose we just have a linear function here. Uh, this is a two-dimensional world or workspace. And so I might imagine that on one side of the function, I just look at the value of the function and look at the sign. Um, if it's negative, I'm on the inside, let's say, and if the value of that function is positive, let's say I'm on the outside. So I can imagine that that function represents a half plane, and then if I want to make a convex obstacle or representation of the robot, I just take the intersection of these. Right? And I can do the same thing in higher dimensions. I can make half spaces by just making the three-dimensional version of that, and we get um, convex uh, bodies by just taking intersections. So these make very clean, nice representations that go all the way back to the beginning of motion planning. Um, one thing that will become important is semi-algebraic sets. So it's very nice um, to also allow polynomials. So um, the line and plane example that I gave is just a special case of a polynomial, right? Just the linear polynomials. So I could have quadratic or higher degree polynomials. I write functions like that. This is the two-dimensional case again here. And I guess it's three-dimensional up there. So we have these kind of primitives. And again, we form um, obstacles out of taking um, intersections. Uh, we form the robot models, again, also out of taking intersections. We can also take unions to, in order to get non-convex representations if we start with linear primitives. And um, in general, when I refer to, refer to semi-algebraic sets, I will mean any kind of representation you can get by taking unions and intersections of these kinds of primitives, where these functions have to be polynomials. Right, so um, it's important to think about these, even though most people's models are usually piecewise linear um, that we end up using, um, things will turn algebraic at some point automatically for us, and that's why I want to uh, talk about this. Um, what kind of models are people actually using in, in motion planning applications, or people are really using motion planners? I want to point out that um, people often refer to polygon soup. So if you, if you get a particular geometric model, maybe it's even designed in a CAD system, um, the model very often will have imperfections in it. So maybe holes in the data. Um, maybe you just have a collection of triangles, maybe triangle strips or triangle fans. And then it might not be so easy to infer, say for this horse model, what's the inside and what's the outside. Right? Because it, and, and so because there's, there's missing pieces in the data. So you could try to clean those up or you could just make methods that just deal with it directly. Right? So the cleanest models, the ones I showed uh, so far, go back to the 1980s. But um, these kinds of models here have been used, I would say, since the 90s in motion planning, and these get fed into collision detection algorithms and such, and we, we work with these, but you know, they're not as pretty, let's say. Um, going further, everyone's in love with point clouds these days, right? So, um, so that makes me tend to think, well, how quickly can we transform point clouds into representations that are suitable for motion planning? And in fact, even if I just have uh, two, two collections of clouds, what does it mean for them to be in collision, right? It still seems like you need more um, segmentation, some kind of solid or surface representations of the collection of points. How do you deal with outliers? All of these kinds of things. So, so it's very interesting. I think still there's a lot of nice uh, problems, even at the level of representation for motion planning, to take data and turn it directly into something that we want to work with. I'd like to have those clean uh, semi-algebraic representations. That gives us kind of the nicest thing to work with for motion planning. But this is the way real data tends to look. And um, um, I, I just wanted to say that there's this nice kind of spectrum. As we go further and further in robotics and in planning, um, it seems like the data that we want to work with gets messier. Right? And we, we need some kind of robustness with respect to that. Um, but the algorithms work better if the data is clean, so you have to decide whether you want to pre-clean it or just try to make it work with the mess. All right. So, of course, we all like transforming robots. Um, um, robots that don't move are, are kind of boring. So, um, so transformation is one of the first things we think about. Um, maybe we have rigid bodies that roll in the plane, or maybe we have uh, flying rigid vehicles, or we might have articulated bodies. Um, I think this is the, the Aldebaran um, humanoid. Um, this is one of uh, how he chose it. Snake robots, for example. There's a deformable uh, body. There's a lot of interest in, um, especially in um, uh, medical research, um, um, for example, uh, steering uh, needles through flexible material and such. People have become interested in deformable uh, bodies as well, so not just rigid bodies. And motion planning has been applied to those kind of problems as well. I think that one's from uh, Kavraki's lab. Um, so just um, some different examples. So we want to transform robots. We want representations of that. Let's go back to the very beginnings of things. Um, if I want to transform, suppose I just want to do a translation of a rigid body in the plane. Um, one of the first things I want to point out is very often when you look up transformations in books, they're usually telling you how to um, um, how to move the coordinate frame 
but most often we're actually moving the robot and keeping the coordinate frame the same. Um, those two are, are uh, um, inverses of each other in some sense. And it often causes confusion sometimes for students when they're first starting out. I just want to point out that um, most things you look up, for example, when you do basic calculus, you're always um, trying to transform the integrand and, and try to solve it differently. Here we're actually moving a body, so, um, so, so things are maybe the reverse of what you think sometimes. Um, the transformations may be the reverse of what you think sometimes. Um, all right, so let's just imagine I have two translation parameters. Um, that should be y sub t. So, of course, I'll find all of the typos now. Um, and so I have x sub t and y sub t, two real parameters. And then I just take every point on the robot. The robot's represented here as a subset of R2. I take every point on the robot, and I just want to map it, um, take the xy coordinates, and just map it to x plus xt and y plus yt, and that's all. So this just means maps to. I just take this and replace it with that. So that's all for translation, very simple. Um, rotation. Again, we always have an axis of rotation. Usually it's somewhere on the body, maybe the center of mass. And then we perform a rotation in the plane. We just do a transformation like this. You can see that the, uh, the standard 2 by 2 rotation matrix has been applied. That takes the body and puts it at some particular theta. Um, I'm dragging you through the particular transformations because they do start to become important the way we represent them when we get uh, into motion planning. So even though you've seen these kind of things before, I'm sure I just want to focus on the representations a little bit, because the representations tend to become very important when you get to computation. Um, so when we combine them, we do rotation first and then translation, because um, otherwise we will move the axis of rotation away. So we rotate first and then translate. They're not commutative. And we can put these together in one nice matrix that just performs the operations for us. So if we arrange it like this, and this is the standard homogeneous uh, matrix representation, which I'll show on the next slide. but. Um, um, I, one, of my, uh, one of my math colleagues told me this once, so it was very nice. You know, what, what exactly is a rigid body transformation? This is a very neat way to think about it. Um, it's just a mapping that is um, orientation preserving, um, and it's an isometric embedding, which I think is very neat. So basically, orientation preserving means you can't flip the robot and take a mirror image. Isometric means any pair of points on the robot that are a certain distance apart must remain that distance apart after the transformation. And it's an embedding, meaning essentially you've stuck it into the workspace as a subset. Right, so it's been embedded. So, uh, so it's very nice. And that, that's all we're talking about are, are these kinds of transformations when we talk about rigid body transformations. Um, a little bit later, I want to talk about the space of all of those. And so that's why it's nice to think about what are the properties that we're maintaining. Um, so again, as I said, you have a homogeneous transformation matrix. It's nice to look at it like this, where you have a rotation matrix in the corner up here. This is multiple components. Um, so that's a two by two matrix here, and this is a translation vector that I've denoted by V. Right. So I'm going to I want to think a little later about the space of all of those matrices. All right. So we move up to three dimensions, and the translation looks the same. I just have some um, geometric body that I've described here called the robot. It's A some subset of R3, we're in a three-dimensional world or workspace. And then, oops, there should be a Z here. So X, Y, Z goes to um, X plus XT, Y plus YT, and Z plus ZT. So uh, we don't increase dimension here. X, Y, Z goes to that. So translation is easy enough. Everything follows in the normal way. Um, things tend to get a little haywire, though, when we get to uh, three-dimensional rotation because uh, we only had one degree of freedom for rotation in the plane, but we pick up three degrees of freedom for rotation in three dimensions. And that ultimately leads to some complications for motion planning, which I, which I will talk about in a bit. Um, different ways to parameterize the rotation. That was like when just first introducing rotation, just to use yaw, pitch, and, and roll. So, um, so these are the different rotation axes. You might imagine this. This, is, this comes from uh, aircraft terminology. So yaw is just a, a rotation um, in, in this direction. Um, what else do we have here? We have roll, which would be like this, if I'm the airplane, and pitch, which is climbing, right, when you feel the airplane climbing or, or descending. Um, so if you look at these, they're very nice because the rotation matrices, the 3 by 3 rotation matrices for there, just have the 2 by 2 rotation matrix nicely embedded in there, right? So this, the outer uh, row and column here, just leave the third coordinate alone while the, the two coordinates here um, the x and y coordinates rotate. So that's what rotation about z does, right? It just changes the x and y coordinates. Um, and then the other two, um, pitch um, moves, uh, changes the x and z coordinates, and then um, roll changes the y and z coordinates. 
So that's all we need. We can combine those. Um, note that, um, you, you, you may know this, but I'm always kind of hammering this into students' heads that um, we can probably know this in robotics pretty well, that um, two-dimensional rotations are commutative and three-dimensional rotations are not. Right? You might get lucky, they might be ones, but, but, they, but in general, they're not. Right? So, um, so the order of operations matters. So this is one particular way to combine the off-pitch and roll. Um, what did I call these again? Let's see, gamma is roll. So this is uh, roll gets applied first, then pitch, and then yaw. And then that makes this 3 by 3 rotation matrix. And you can show that that's sufficient to parameterize all rotation matrices, 3 by 3 rotation matrices. And um, you know, these are the standard properties that a rotation matrix must have. So you can go and verify that we're, in fact, setting this up. They do have unit column vectors, and they're pairwise orthogonal. And the uh, determinant, sorry, the determinant is 1. Um, and again, we can put this into homogeneous transform mode, where we just have the full 3 by 3 rotation matrix up here, and then we have a three-dimensional um, translation vector there, so that makes a 4 by 4 matrix. I want to start talking about the space of all of these matrices in a little bit. And, and remember that whatever rotation matrix I put up here, it has some constraints on it that I just gave, right? that the, um, the columns need to be orthogonal and um, have unit uh, magnitude. Um, of course, we don't just transform rigid bodies, a single rigid body. We may have bodies connected together. And um, in this case, um, if they're independent, we just have a transformation matrix, a homogeneous transformation matrix for each body. Um, we can nicely couple those together um, to make motion planning algorithms. But if they are um, rigidly attached, sorry, non-rigidly attached, they're, 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 they're connected together, but there's some flexibility, then um, we may have a revolute joint or a prismatic joint in the plane. And then we tend to develop specialized transformations that we can use in succession because we don't have all the freedom that we once had if they happen to be free bodies, right, if they were not attached. Um, and so very often we use a chain of matrices where maybe we have the, um, the full homogeneous transformation matrix for the first body. And then when we start chaining them together, um, usually for each one of the intermediate bodies, um, we just look at the amount of translation and rotation with respect to the way they're attached. When I look at the local frame of each one, um, I think for this example, this would be A here and 0 here, where A is the distance between these two points. So we just chain together a bunch of matrices. I'm not going to go drag you all the details of kinematics. There's plenty of other places to get that. Um, but um, in three dimensions, there's more um, ways that we can attach bodies together and still allow degrees of freedom. With surfaces sliding, these are the standard um, six ways that to, to attach bodies. The upper three give one degree of freedom, and you get higher degrees of freedom going down here. And people develop, of course, DH parameters and uh, allele Klein finger parameterizations. And you know, they, they serve various purposes and um, have different kinds of advantages. Most people in robotics, of course, are picking these um, to try to make inverse kinematic calculations simplified for robot manipulators when you want to know um, you want to put the end effector somewhere and you want to do calculations of inverse kinematics. For robotics, though, I mean, sorry, for motion planning, though, we have um, different ideas in mind. And you may want to go back and rethink these parameterizations based on some of the issues I'm going to bring up. They might not be ideally suited for some of the things we want to do in motion planning. Um, all right. And then finally, um, of course, we can have, an, instead of just a chain of bodies, we can have a tree of bodies. Or we can have closed kinematic chains, which um, cause some, some extra kind of trouble because we have to maintain closure the whole time. So if I, lock my, my, my hands together, you know, what are the various combinations of parameters that keep my hands together and do not break them apart, right? So you have extra constraints to maintain, and this becomes somewhat difficult. I'll refer back to that a couple of times, but I won't go too far into that in this tutorial. I just want to point that out, that you can go up to, tree, to chains and trees. It's still reasonably easy to talk about the space of transformations, but it gets then really hard as soon as you have closed chains. Um, all right. So, I want to start to get into uh, topological considerations. Um, most of us, um, you know, going back when I was a student in planning, um, I started learning topology for the first time for the purpose of studying a uh, motion planning problem. And I think it's a very nice way to think about um, what we have to do. Um, so, so path planning really becomes a search on the space of transformations. That's the thing to think about. Right? I, I mentioned different particular transformations for you. And if you want to make an animation or a simulation, you can use these transformations, and you can put the robot anywhere you want. You can visualize things great. But when you do planning, it's important to understand that it's the space of all transformations where the problem lives. And that's what we have to really think about, representing that, building data structures over that, 
um, building pads over that. Uh, that's really the, where the problem is. And what does this space look like? It's kind of a strange space for people if they've not, um, it doesn't look exactly like RN. And there's certain operations you can do on it. You can represent it in different ways that affect the performance. There's some ways you can choose to represent the space that might lead to flaws in your motion planning algorithm. So that's a problem. There's other ways you might choose to represent the space that look easy, but they may cut down your performance by a factor of 10 because it's not somehow nicely representing the space. So I just want to get you to think in the right way. What kind of operations can we perform on the space of all transformations and still be safe, let's say, for motion planning? And, and better yet, what can we do to optimize performance? Right. So um, there, there's, there's three ways, I would say, to view the configuration space. One is, is, is a topological manifold, which is a concept I will introduce in a bit, um, or as a metric space, which is also something I will introduce. But when I start using the word manifold, I just want to say something in particular about it. Um, number three, a differentiable manifold. For most people who have seen manifolds before, almost always are, are familiar with number three. And it usually brings to mind Oh, I don't know, um, lots of differential equations and calculus and coordinate transformations. And if you go far enough into differential geometry, you may see Christoffel symbols and all sorts of other stuff. And um, there's a lot of machinery there. And what's nice about topological manifolds is that it doesn't use any of that. So it's actually much simpler to describe topological manifolds and do operations with them. You don't have to drag all of the, um, let's say, ugly calculus. I know it's pretty for some people, and it is pretty sometimes, but you don't have to drag people through all of the calculus to talk about topological manifolds. They're actually very nice. They're just much less common. So because of that, I think manifolds get a bad name. Like there's this large um, learning curve to, to get comfortable with, with manifolds and such. And, and um, turns out topological manifolds have a shorter learning curve, but it's topological weird stuff, let's say, that you have to learn in order to understand them. So it's, it's a different thing, but um, it's not too bad. And then actually you can add all of the differentiable structure onto topological manifolds and you get everything if you want. So you don't have to actually give up differential manifolds either. It's just you need more stuff. So all we're doing is stripping away the calculus stuff from manifolds. Right? So let me talk about just topological space in general. This is the most general uh, definition, one of the most general definitions. I think it's nice to have this because it's a very short definition. So um, it's so general that it doesn't take very many pieces to define it. It is very nice. Um, if I can just start with any set, x, doesn't matter, no constraints on it. And I want to look at some of the sets in the power set of x, right? So very easy for me to mention the power set of x. Of course, if x is the set of all real numbers, the power set's enormous, but I can write down power set of x very short, right? So this is a short description. Um, so I look at all of these subsets, and I just want to declare some of them to be open sets. That'll be their name. I'm just going to call them open sets, some of them. And the other ones will not be open sets. <coughs> I can do that in any way that I like, but if I satisfy these three rules, I'll get what's called a topological space. Let's just look at the rules. But however I define, right, I'm just taking all the sets in the power set, calling some of them open and some of them not open. I'm not calling the other ones closed, by the way. I'm just saying they're either open or not open. So um, I can define them however I like, as long as I make sure these rules hold, the union of any number of open sets needs to remain an open set. All right, so, so if I gather up some of the sets that I declare to be open, I take their union, I have to still have something that I declared to be an open set. So I can make them up any way I want, these named open sets, but I have to satisfy that. And by any number, I mean you can even do a countable union if you want. So, um, so you can gather up a countable infinite number of them, union them all together. You still have to have an open set. Um, for intersection, there's one slight difference here. It's finite instead of any number. So um, it has to be the case that for any finite number of open sets, whatever I've declared to be open, then um, the intersection remains an open set. Um, it turns out there's very simple examples on the real number line. I can just um, I can get a, I can take a collection of open intervals and intersect them all and just get a single point if I do an infinite number of intersections. And that would not be normally what we would think about as an open set. So that's the reason why it's finite there. All this is trying to generalize something that worked out very nicely on the real numbers. Um, and the whole space itself and the empty set, the zero slash, there's just the empty set. Those are both open sets, they have to be always. Um, now, one extra thing, I will refer to closed sets. All they are is a set is closed if and only if its complement is open. So think complement. Don't think closed means not open. That's, that's not correct. Um, closed means that the complement is open. Right? Um, and it's kind of weird, but that, that means there's going to be a lot of subsets of x that could be neither one. 
Um, you can make a topological space where every set is either open or closed. It's fine, but most of the time, and for the real numbers, for example, um, the sets could be um, neither open nor closed. Um, and um, a very simple example on the real numbers is um, just take an, an interval that's half open and half closed. So all the numbers between 0 and 1, but I'll not include 0, but I will include 1. So that set would be not open and not closed. Um, can anybody think of sets that are both open and closed? Open and closed? Which sets are open and closed? What was that? Yeah, the whole space. Right. In fact, if I just use this general definition, I said x, which, which if you're using it, doing that as a topological space, that would be open. Um, both x, you know, x has to be open by this definition. Its complement is closed by this definition, right? So that means that has to be closed. This is also open, and that its complement um, is closed. So both of them are closed and open. Um, so many people call that clopen, but I, I, I don't do that. So, um, um, so anyway, it's just something to think about. It, it doesn't, it's not a binary property, open or closed, that every set has. Students get confused about that sometimes. Um, OK. Well, you have a choice of what topologies to use. And I'm going to now no longer be, let's say, ridiculously general here. I mean, this is so general, the set could be anything, right? It could be a set of houses and buses and cars and robots. It doesn't matter, really, right? It could be anything. So um, I want to restrict it now so that it's giving us more or less what we need to talk about um, the space of transformations and, and robot planning and these kinds of things, right? So, so that was much too general for us, but I think it's nice, actually, that, that these definition exists at that level. The reason why it does is because even at that level, mathematicians have been able to prove interesting statements that generalize um, things that happen over the real numbers and such, and I think that's quite amazing. But, but um, um, we don't need to go to that level of generality. I, first of all, just want to make my topological space be a subset of Rn, and in this case, n is going to be higher than 2 or 3, generally. It could be 2 or 3, but it may be much higher than that. But it's finite. And um, I want to, I'm going to use the standard open sets that come with Rn. So if you've ever talked about open sets before in Euclidean space, I want to start with those. So I'm not going to do any weird stuff to you. You, know, you can make a weird topological space out of Rn. I could just say all subsets of Rn are now open. Is that going to be OK? Would that satisfy these? If I did that, if I said all subsets of Rn are open? Violate anything here? Can I do that? Let's see. Let's try that, right? Still a little early, right? Maybe I know a lot of people have jet lag coming from various countries and continents and such. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, if every if every set is open, what the union of oh, I guess the union is going to be satisfied. Intersection is going to be satisfied. Yeah, I can make all of the subsets open, right? So I could say for R n, all subsets are open, right? This definition allows that, right? That's what I might call a useless topology. Right? So uh, that's a useless topological thing, but it's fine. Right? So when we, when we talk about Rn, I'm going to use the standard topology, which is going to be, you know, I could say Rn and all sets are open, and the mathematicians don't care. Fine. Do what you like. So you can make different kinds of topologies, even out of your old familiar spaces. But I'm going to say the topology I want to use is just the standard open sets. Standard open set, there's different ways to define it. You can define it with a basis of uh, open balls and such, if you like. But uh, I'm just going to say this. Um, the set is open if, for every point I pick, right, it's a subset of Rn, and it's an open set if every point that's in the set, I can find a tiny um, ball around that point that's entirely contained in the set. Right? So if that's the case, then I'll just say the set is open. That's a standard way to get the open sets for the real numbers. Right? Every, every subset I pick of Rn, I ask the question. Right? If I pick an isolated point, it's not going to work, right? I can't fit a ball inside. Um, if I pick a closed set, normally what we call closed set, I would include the boundary along here. Then I can take this point and stick it right on the boundary. And then I don't get a ball that fits inside of there, right? So that's a standard open set. And then um, when I talk about these different topological spaces x that I'm making here, it is going to be very helpful in motion planning to talk about open sets and closed sets. It turns out very important, especially for optimal motion planning. It may be the case, if you have some experience in optimization, um, you may know that if you want the existence of a optimal solution for your problem, for some function you're optimizing, it's usually nice to have compactness on the domain, right? The domain, uh, if it's closed and bounded, for example, um, 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 that will ensure the existence of a solution under appropriate conditions on the function. So um, same kind of thing's going to happen here. We're going to care about open and closedness in this space of transformations that I'm going to get to. 
So all we do is we, we, we form the open sets by just taking intersections. So if my set X is a subset of Rn, like I said, then I get my open sets here by just taking the intersections. So whatever sets I have in Rn, right, I want to ask which sets in X, right, which subsets of X are open. Well, they're only open if there exists a set O here that can overhang, right, and, and it exists in Rn. And when I take the intersection, I get, um, um, I had an open set here. The intersection will be declared to be open. Is that okay? Um, so that's, that should make some kind of sense. So for example, um, let's see. What if this is, what if X here is a closed disk? All right, so actually let me make it an open disk first. Let's suppose it's an open disk. So suppose this is a disk and it does not include the boundary here. All right? If I, and this is an open disk here. So if I take the intersection, I just get a nice uh, open, what is that, crescent or something, right? So that should look like an open set in the usual way. What if I make this a, oh, maybe I, no, I did no problem. Um, what if I make this a closed disk, so I include the boundary here, and I take the intersection, will this piece look different? Right? It now has this little piece along the boundary. Is that still going to be an open set? And who says yes? And who says no? All right. All right. Well, I'm, I'm a, you know, kind of a democratic guy. Let's just take the popular answer. All right. And we'll say yes. Um, no. the, the reason why yes is correct, and the reason why is because um, we are now, you know, if, if this were a subset of R n, in that space it is not an open set, right? But if we restrict our space to x, that's our new topological space. Then what happens when we get to the edge of x? Right? When we get to the edge of x, um, it's okay to include these points because there's really nothing on the other side. So it's a strange kind of thing that happens here. And that's one implication of this. If I say that's how I form my, my open sets, by just taking intersection, that will still be an open set. But you have to pay very close attention to the fact that that's in this topological space uh, X. So it's, the space itself has been restricted as if the rest of Rn no longer even exists. Right? So that's the idea. OK. Any questions? It's really like a class, right? You know, I'm really just trying to go through the, the, the basics here. I hope that's okay. Um, I have been referring to boundaries, so let me um, let me just state these a little bit uh, more clearly. So if I talk about now some subset, before I had X, I was talking about an entire topological space X down there. Well, now I have U, just some subset. So say X is out here. I just have some subset U, and I want to talk about points on the boundary of U or points inside or outside of you. So that's why I just want to be able to say that in a very nice way. And here's a way to do it. Let's look at number two and three first. So a point on the interior of you, uh, x2 here is in the interior, if there exists an open set that contains x2, and all of that open set is contained in you. Now I formed everything out of Rn here. So if you want your open set O1 could just be a tiny ball, right? So. So that, that feels like interior, right? You know, as long as I can put an open ball around it. Um, of course, if we go back to my weird example here where um, I got all the way up to the boundary, then yeah, you're going to have like these half-looking balls, and that's going to be fine. It's still going to work, so it's strange. But, but um, um, it gets a little weird, as I said, for this particular case. Um, so over here, um, this would be exterior. It's just a complement, same idea. This point is outsider in the exterior. It's an exterior point because there exists an open set, say O2, that contains the point and it's entirely contained in the complement. So it's all the way outside. I should mention, by the way, I may have forgotten, um, all, all the slides are online. Um, I'll try to make corrections to them and such, but you're welcome to, if, you, if it's convenient for you, you can download them and flip through them as well. Um, so if it's neither of these, if it's neither interior or exterior, then it's what we call a boundary point. And that's it. Right, so now you don't have to draw a picture of what boundary means intuitively. It has a rigorous definition. It just means that if there does not exist an open set that puts it on the inside or the outside, then it has to be a boundary point. And that's it. Again, if I, if I had that weird topology where I included the boundary here, and this was a disk, and I included the boundary, if I put a point right here on the boundary, and this little sliver here would be the set U, would that point be in the interior? Turns out it would be on the interior, which is 
screen, right? So, so follow the definitions, it's, it's kind of nice. That's a little more, let's say, hair splitting than, than, than we need to do for, for, for the motion planning stuff I want to talk about. But I think it's nice to get these things uh, right. Okay. Um, I have to I have to give the topological definition of continuous functions because um, the way in which we let's say reshape our manifolds is going to be based on something called homeomorphism coming next, and that's based on continuous functions. So I just need to give this a little bit maybe odd-looking definition of continuous functions. Um, I think you've seen definitions of continuous functions before. Probably you've, most often you see the one that says what if you if you change the domain a little bit the range changes a little bit, right? There's deltas and epsilons, right? And there's not a significant jump, right? Well, this is another way to do it without any deltas or epsilons. It's a purely topological way. So that this definition of continuous functions works all the way up in spaces that are as ridiculously general as that. And so, so it's very nice. So, so again, even if your set is a collection of houses, buses, and cars, or some weird discrete set, and you may have open sets on it, this definition will work. Um, so I take a function, x to y. I have two topological spaces now. And I want to say, what does it mean for it to be a continuous function? Right? So a function's continuous if, when I look at any open set, that's an open set uh, here in the, uh, the range or the co-domain, if you like, or the target set of the function here. So I look at any open set here. I'm just taking open intervals, and I'm just making one-dimensional examples here. But it doesn't matter really what the space is. I look at the, what's called the pre-image. Um, that, that notation looks like inverse, right? But the function doesn't necessarily have to have an inverse. And I'm just saying, I want to know all of the points in the domain that map to O. That's what that notation means. So if I take a subset, O, say O1 here, I open a subset, and I look at the pre-image, if these are the real numbers here, X and Y are, are the, the set of reals, and then um, if I pick O1, and so let's just look at this part of the function. Suppose the rest of it didn't exist, because it's going to cause trouble in a minute. Um, this looks very much like what we all think of as a continuous function, a linear function. So if I take this open set and I look at the preimage, it's open, right? So, so it looks like it's nice. It's, if this is an open interval, that's an open interval. Do we agree? Right, so that's very nice that that happens. When we get up to this case, here, O2, um, what's happening here? So I have to be very careful. The function is doing a discontinuous jump that we can all see very clearly, because this is an easy example. And I'm just giving a notation that indicates um, where it jumps at. What happens precisely at this point? So precisely at this point in the domain, um, what's happening is, I hope, that, I hope that lines up. I guess that's, that's supposed to line up. Maybe it doesn't. It kind of looks odd. Um, so um, when, when, when I look precisely at this uh, point here, then um, this part of the interval here is closed, so the, the, the value of the function precisely along this vertical line is here, and then it continues over this way. So this part looks like a half open interval, essentially. Right? I cannot get to the end here, I jump down there. Right? And uh, yeah, I guess if I trace this through, in fact, if I would have drawn the dashed lines, I probably would have noticed this thing should be moved over a little bit. It should be right here. Okay? Um, and it moves further over, it also picks up this part and drops this down. But this piece right here looks like an open interval, right? This piece here. But this piece here, if it were drawn right, um, is that open? It, it's not open. It, it has a, it's open on this side, but then closed on this side, right? Because we pick up all of these points. So this exact condition looks like a perfect kind of detector for detecting discontinuities, but it's only defined with open sets. So it's very clean and very nice. Um, that's all we have for that. Um, I guess one thing that's very nice with this definition of continuous functions is that um, maybe, maybe you've been dragged through the proof that the composition of continuous functions is continuous. If you do it with deltas and epsilons, it makes sort of a page of algebraic mess. And here it works very easily because you just take the pre-image of the pre-image. Right? Each function is continuous, so the pre-image of an open set has to be open. So when you compose them, all that happens is the pre-image of the pre-image is open and you're done. So it's like a one-line proof. It's very nice. Uh, you have a question? Um, which, which, which direction? Oh, yeah, yeah, I see. Um, then, oh, yeah, that's very nice. So, so if instead the bubble's here, that would mean that, you know, this part here would look open, right? And this part here would look open. But we cannot conclude that that's a continuous function because I'll just move this up here, right? So this condition has to work for 
any open set, even ones that aren't intervals, right? You can take unions of intervals and all of that stuff. So, so you get to play the devil's advocate and pick the, 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 the nastiest interval you want to try to show that the function is discontinuous. So the function has to survive the kind of test of, of, of an infinite collection of, of, of open intervals in order to, to, to make it work. Any other questions? All right. Um, so when we have continuous, now we can get to this nice idea of homeomorphism. Um, so, if, so this is between two spaces again. So I have two uh, spaces X and Y, and homeomorphism sounds fancy, but um, all it's saying is that that function and its inverse are continuous. Um, I guess that function had better be bijective, right? So I probably should have added that. But you have a bijective function, so it's one to one and onto. Hence, an inverse exists, right? And I can map back and forth. So I just want continuity in both directions. And I want continuous using exactly that definition. Okay, so just, uh, which also, by the way, does imply exactly the definition of continuity that you might have learned in basic calculus or something. It's the same thing. Um, there are stronger definitions of continuity, by the way, that are useful, like absolutely continuous and things like that. There's a lot of weird functions that are, well, they're technically continuous, but don't look like they should be. Uh, all right. So I have that. And um, let me give an example. I could take this interval here of length 2, and I can take all of the real numbers. Are they homeomorphic? Right? I take, a, I, take a, I take a kind of a tiny interval, you know, only length 2, and then I take all of the real numbers. It's unbounded. But if I just do this, I hope I got it right, I just do this very simple mapping here. And um, x goes to 2 tan inverse x over pi. I think then every number in between here will be mapped to a real number. So it's one to one and on to. Everything's perfectly fine here. So that means that this interval here and this line here are homeomorphic. Not only that, but so is this zigzag here. Because again, the definition of continuity doesn't care about this. I can write a nice function that takes every point along this zigzag and maps it to different places along this interval, right? And I can very carefully look at the open sets in this way that we defined it and make sure that, that, in fact, we, we, there exists a mapping. Uh, most often, topologists are not explicitly constructing the mappings and making a big deal out of them. Right? They tend not to care as much about particular coordinate systems or particular geometry. They're, they're happy once there's a proof that two spaces are homeomorphic, they're done. You know, they go on to the next thing. Right? So, but if you don't believe that it's homeomorphic, then you have to go and do the details, right? construct the mapping. Showing that spaces are not homeomorphic is a little more work because you have to show that there does not exist a mapping. right? That kind of reminds me of uh, problems like undecidability, right, in algorithms. Showing that a problem is undecidable is, uh, you know, if you want to show it's decidable, produce an algorithm, right? If it's undecidable, you have to show that, well, you could try all possible algorithms and none of them will work, right? So that's a bit trickier. So the same kind of thing here. Um, so all of these spaces are homeomorphic. You can make it nice and curved like this. You can make it a spiral. Topologists don't care. This is called morphism in the same sense like um, isomorphism in group theory or isomorphism in graph theory. Well, why do we make morphisms in mathematics? Like the morphisms are, are, are defined so that once we're done with that, it makes an equivalence relation so that we never have to distinguish between them anymore, right? So if I, if I take the, um, the Rubik's cube, I define its transformations as a group. I could talk about a Rubik's cube, or I could talk about, um, I could define it in terms of permutations of some kind, right, with matrices and such. So I can do it either way. I don't care the representations are isomorphic. It doesn't matter, right? So same kind of idea here. The morphism that the topologists like is homeomorphism, right? So that's their isomorphism, if you like. Um, and so these spaces are all the same to, the, to a topologist. That's exactly the kind of operations we can do on the space of all transformations and still be OK. Um, here's another one. We can, um, um, all of these are homeomorphic to each other. And they're not homeomorphic to the one up here. And what's going to happen is, the reason why is because um, if you take the endpoints of the intervals here, of say this interval or the zigzag, if I connect them together, I'll get something that looks like a circle. But I cannot produce a perfect, a continuous bijection that goes from one of these to one of these. I'm going to always end up with these same kind of problems like we had on this page with the um, uh, with discontinuity coming up. Now, I don't have a, a full proof of that because I have to show that there does not exist such a, a homeomorphism, which is a little more trouble. But if you try to make one, 
Um, that's not the homework assignment yet, but if you try to make one, you, you can find the difficulties very quickly of what to do with the endpoints. Right? So note that the topologist does not care about boundedness. Right? R goes on forever. Right? It's not bounded. I can't just fit it inside of a, a small interval. Right? That's what boundedness means. In general, a subset of Rn is bounded if I can put it inside of a box. Right? If there exists a box of finite dimensions that I can put it in. So, the topologist doesn't care about boundedness, but they, but they do really care about these continuous functions. They really don't like, you know, if there's an extra point, some dangling endpoint, eventually they're going to care a lot about holes. Like you could say these all have a hole in the interior. As far as the topologist is concerned, this is a line and this is a circle. Right? So this is a circle. Is that fine? We might call it a polygon, a simple polygon. But if you're thinking, if you have your topology hat on, then and you're thinking like a topologist, then those are all circles. So I'm going to give names for those. I'm going to call the, the, the ones up above R, and I don't care how it looks in particular. I'll call the ones below S1, which is going to be circle to a topologist. Um, here's some examples that are mutually non-homeomorphic, so no pair homeomorphic. Um, so these all, you know, they look different, right? They have different kinds of endpoints and problems. There's my circle again. I guess that one's two circles. Interestingly enough, if I took that triangle and put it outside here, that would be also, you can make a homeomorphism that does that, right? That's not too bad. If I, if I took this case, that's two circles, put it down here. That, very easy to make a homeomorphism. It just translates that. That's also fine. However, topologists start to care about those sometimes when you get into knot theory. Um, and and there's, there's, there are ways to distinguish between those. But most of the time, they don't care. So these basic definitions, it doesn't matter where these are. If you have two pieces in your space, you have one inside of the other, it doesn't matter. Um, what is that? So that's a subset of R2. Um, people call that an annulus, maybe, right? Um, a topologist might just look at that and say, ah, oh, that's a cylinder. So it turns out that that's the same as a cylinder. Um, it's homeomorphic to a cylinder. I, I, I'll show that in a little bit with examples and such. All right, good. We're about halfway through this, this, this part, and I'm about halfway through with my slides, so that should be pretty good. Are there any questions at this point? Other than why on earth are you dragging me through all of the, these topological details? A little bit of that, maybe. Um, over the course of the day, this will turn more and more into like a survey of recent stuff. You know, that's what it will look like in the last part. But, but it, it starts off very, you know, I want to make it like a school-like, let's say. And then we just go over the, the details here. Um, I'm trying to pick the subtle details that I see students missing from time to time. Ultimately, that comes to burn them later on in some algorithm designs and such. So that's, why I'm trying to trying to pick the most relevant parts and such. Uh, all right, so now we're up. We're, we have enough to be able to define what's called a manifold. And again, remember, if you've had differentiable manifolds before, um, which is if you have manifold experience, that's probably what you were dealing with. And you may remember a lot of calculus, and you may worry about charts and atlases and all of that stuff, right? Um, you don't have to worry about charts and atlases here. Nobody cares. Right? Well, somebody cares, but but we don't care today with this. Um, so M is called a manifold. <laughs> And again, just subset of RM. Um, there exist more general definitions, but hey, this is fine for, for robotics. We don't need anything crazier than this for motion planning. Um, I use the standard subset topology, and I just want to say some of these subspaces are manifolds and some are not. Here's what it takes to be a manifold. I have to look at every point in the space, say point X here, and there has to exist an open, excuse me, there has to exist an open set now, this is nice. You get to pick whichever one you like. So instead of being devil's advocate here, it doesn't have to work for all open sets. right? You just pick one. There has to exist one so that x is inside of it. And the, 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 the set I picked is homeomorphic to Rn. So I'm building on my definitions. right? We're back to homeomorphism again. Right? We have this kind of thing going on. We have homeomorphism. But um, it has to be homeomorphic to Rn. And, um, Whatever that n is, it needs to be the same for all points that I pick on the manifold. And then that, that n will be called the dimension of the manifold. I don't think I put it on the slide, but there's two letters here. There's m. m is the space that I started with here, rm. Right? That's the dimension of the space I started with. That's usually larger than n. could be the same. But n, which is the dimension of the manifold, um, is what I'm talking about here, that's the one that has to be the same for all points. So I look at all possible points on the manifold. For each one, there has to exist an open set that's homeomorphic to um, R, Rn. 
if this was a two-dimensional manifold, then every point I pick here, it needs to be that I can pick a disk, let's say, take an open disk, and that disk has to be homeomorphic to R2. Right? And that would make a two-dimensional manifold. So if, all, if, if I were only able to pick open sets that look like an annulus for some reason, then I would have trouble, so, or some other weird structure. But I can get away with each one being a disk so it looks like R2. What's nice about it is it's just trying to say something friendly, let's say, about the, the space, which is that it feels like Rn at every point as far as the topologist is concerned. Remember, the topologist doesn't care about boundedness. So you can pick a very tiny open set around x, and that's going to look like Rn to a topologist. That's the, that's the main idea of a manifold, is that it looks like Rn. Um, if you care more about, um, I don't know, people, in, for example, in machine learning, they talk about manifold learning. The way they mean manifold there, I think they care very often that it looks close to linear in some neighborhood, right? Here, linearity doesn't matter. That can, you can be right at a corner. But just to a topologist, does it look like Rn in terms of homeomorphism? So again, this is a much more powerful kind of uh, transformation. A lot of flexibility is allowed here. Um, so here's some examples. These would be manifolds. The manifold can be in two pieces. could be two line segments or two lines. What we really don't like happening is something like this. Maybe you try to make a two-dimensional manifold here, but it's joined at a single point here. So if I pick an open set around that point, I'm doomed, right? The open set will look like a bow tie, and that's not homeomorphic to R2. So that's not going to be a manifold. As soon as you find one point on your proposed manifold for which there does not exist an open set that's homeomorphic to Rn, then you're done. So here's a bad point here. It's a t-junction. So if I try to make an open set here, remember the subset topology. So if this t-junction was in R2, and I try to pick an open set here, it's just going to make little t's, right? No matter what I do, if I try to include that point and I make an open set, it's going to be little open t-shapes. And open t-shapes are not going to be homeomorphic to R. So that's not a one-dimensional manifold. All right? So that's kind of the idea. If you, if you dimensionality changes, you end up with weird junctions, other stuff like that, not going to work. Otherwise, everything's fine. I don't care. Corners, no problem. We don't care about that. Now, in the usual manifold definitions, you may, you may want to have a smooth manifold or differentiable manifold that you may be more familiar with, and then this would not be, right? This would be a piecewise smooth manifold. And uh, again, we don't care about that here today. Any questions about that? Okay, moving on. Um, go through some manifold examples, and then I finally go to the space of transformations. Right, so um, we have Rn. That's a distinct manifold for each n. That's going to have to be that way. So, so Rn, you know, R2 is not homeomorphic to R3, so those are different manifolds. Um, S1 is the one I told you about. That's the circle. And remember, the circle could look like a square or a simple polygon. doesn't matter. That does not include the interior, by the way. Note the equals here. And um, here are some examples of cylinders. So cylinders could look like the surface of a cylinder. I do not mean this to be a solid can, but I mean just, a, just the, the, the two-dimensional surface of it. So that's a cylinder. But that's also a cylinder, and so is that. Right? Do you believe that? So if you're thinking like a topologist, all those are cylinders, big deal, right? Yeah, yeah, more and more cylinders. Okay, That's perfectly fine. But to most people off the street, say, oh, that doesn't look like a cylinder. Right? So that's okay. So that's... That's how these things look. Uh, here's another one, in fact. I can take R2 and just remove a single point. And that's also a cylinder. Pretty neat, right? So I just take the origin and remove it from R2. It's a cylinder. That okay? Right? A little weird, but that's, that's how it looks. Okay. Um, here's, a, here's a way to represent it. So, so one thing that's very nice, and this becomes convenient when we start representing um, these spaces for, for motion planning. Um, I start with, let's say, uh, an open square, uh, 0, 1 cross 0, 1. And then I do what's called identification. I just make an equivalence relation. I'm going to take this side here and say it's equivalent to this side, pairwise equivalent. So if they have the same y coordinate, then they're the same point by definition. If I do that, that's like gluing. So I glue the sides together. That's really nice. That makes here what's called a flat cylinder. It doesn't seem to have any curvature, right? Uh, so I can do this for a lot of other cases. I can make a flat Mobius band. Here's how a Mobius band usually looks in a nice picture. But if I just do a twist in the identification, right, so I do y to 1 minus y, 
then all of a sudden that represents topologically a Mobius band. That's not homeomorphic to the cylinder um, because of the twist, it turns out. So, um, so that makes another one, the flat Mobius band. They say you can't flatten them, but yes, you can, as long as you believe in identification. There's weird ideas going on. Um, here's some more examples. Um, the torus is a good one. I just I take the sides here, I identify those. I also identify the top and the bottom, right? So when I identify the sides, I made a cylinder. When I identify the top and bottom, I now have the surface of a donut as far as a topologist is concerned, right? I like to imagine this in terms of um, 1980s video games. You may remember old games like Asteroids and stuff. When you fly off the screen somewhere, you come back somewhere else, right? So actually, when you're playing Asteroids, you're on a flat torus. That's all. So it's just exactly that. That's the space you're on. You never felt like you were on a donut, probably, but that's, that's how it is. Um, and you can do some more. I can put a twist in it, and I get a Klein model if I twist the torus once. If I twist the tor torus twice, I get the projective plane, which ends up being very important for us. Um, so that is a, there's a twist in the horizontal direction and a twist in this direction. So I did the Mobius band trick, but I did it on the sides and the top. So that means that every point that's kind of opposite here ends up being the same. Like uh, that corner is the same as that corner. Um, this side is the same as that side. So it goes around like that, that identification. Um, the two sphere is another useful one, um, um, S2, um, um, just, a, just a, like the surface of the Earth if it were perfect. Um, so those are some um, different examples. Projective plane is going to become important in a bit. Um, it has that name because it, it comes from projective spaces, projective geometry. It's homeomorphic to. Um, I guess that one should be homeomorphic to the set of all lines through the origin in R3. Uh, that's a two-dimensional space, so that's where that comes from. Um, all right, so now we're up to configuration spaces. I want to think about the configuration space of all rigid bodies. So that's going to be all transformations like this, which I already gave you. Well, SEN, that's just a fancy name we give. It's a Lie group. Um, it's the, the set of and group of all n plus 1 by n plus 1 um, dimensional uh, homogeneous transformation matrices, so they're n, n plus 1 by n plus 1, because remember we added an extra dimension so that we could just kind of cram on the, uh, the translation parameters by just it's a nice trick, right? Just making the linear algebra do the work for you and, and apply the rotation first and then the translation. Well, so now I, I talked about subsets of Rn and I talked about manifolds. Well, in the two dimensional case, SE2, that's a subset of R9, right? Right, remember that? The, the rotation matrix is 2 by 2. I have an extra dimension, so it's 3 by 3. So I have nine real numbers I can put in there. But I can't put any numbers in there, right? I have constraints. Very clearly, I have to put zeros here and a 1 here. This is multiple zeros, by the way. 2 for the two-dimensional case, 3 for the three-dimensional case. And I have R16 for the next dimension up. But what exactly is going on, right? The subset of matrices that you're allowed to have as homogeneous transformation matrices, what do these look like? Well, if I have a, a 2D rigid body, uh, let's take a look at that. So I can imagine placing this body, it's like the robot. I placed it at some translation and rotation, x, t, y, t, theta. And so that's where I put it to. And um, I have a, um, I, I, I can just do a nice uh, homeomorphism here to say that uh, theta can be mapped to cosine theta sine theta. Is that right? That does what? That maps theta to a, a unit circle. Right? So that really says, look, the set of all rotations here that we can make, it's very easy to see, is just a circle, right? It's a circle of rotations. <laughs> so the configuration space here, translations can be any x, y parameters. And this is a circle because 0 and 2 pi are the same. I can also make the flat circle, right? The flat circle just looks like a line segment, and I just say the, the endpoints are identified. Um, so, so I say that the configuration space, and now we finally are talking about the set of all transformations, which is the configuration space. The configuration space is R2 cross S1, Cartesian product. I have two components that behave like the reals, and then I have an S1 component. Um, and by the way, we, we tend to write equals in, in uh, motion planning books and papers and such. What we really mean is homeomorphic to, because we're thinking like topologists. And, and so that's an equivalence. So it feels kind of OK, but sometimes you might want to put maybe some squiggly symbol on top of the equals or something like that, you know, to, to denote that it's something a little more powerful than uh, everyday equality. Uh, all right. Well, how else can I represent this R2 cross S1? So um, 
Well, this looks like a kind of cylinder because when I look at R process one, that was a cylinder, right? Remember that R process one. If I go back to, um, let's say, uh, this diagram here, here's a cylinder. I didn't mention it. Here's, oh no, I did. I did the flat cylinder, right? That's just one slide before. Um, two slides before. There's my flat cylinder, right? That's R cross S1. I didn't write it, but in this direction, it looks like S1, right? This looks like a circle. And then in this direction, it's like R. It's an interval, but I could stretch all the way out to R. It doesn't matter by homeomorphism. Right? So what I have now for the configuration space of a planar rigid body is just a, a thicker cylinder. Because I have R2 now instead of just R crossed with S1. Here's one way to visualize it. I can imagine it looks like, um, I think this is a batting donut for uh, American baseball, if you know, people warm up with these. So anyway, um, so, so um, it looks like a thick cylinder. It's solid, but it still has a kind of circular component to it, if you like. Um, but I can make a flat version out of that, if you want, which looks like this. I just make a box. Here's the X translation. Here's the Y translation. And if you want to make it go off to infinity, that's fine. But we usually use a finite range anyway for motion planning, right? Our robots usually don't go off to infinity and come back, right? So um, I guess once they go off to infinity, I guess they have to kind of be done by definition. But they usually don't do that. So, um, so we have two components here. And then the third component has top and bottom identification. So that's a very common way now to represent the configuration space for a planar rigid body is a, a cube. Maybe, maybe it could be rectangular. It doesn't have to be a perfect cube. And then the top is the same as the bottom. Because this is uh, 2 pi, and this would be 0. Is that OK? Well, the three-dimensional body gets a lot more interesting. So, um, so if we get to that case, let's go back to our yaw pitch roll parameters. Um, you may have heard of the gimbal lock problem. Um, so that comes from um, classically trying to measure orientation. Um, there's, a, there's a famous um, sort of panic that happened on the Apollo 11 mission because they decided to only use three gimbals and gimbal lock occurred and it was a big deal. But they had to fly by, hand, by, by, by um, well, human um, guessing for a while. Um, anyway, things were fine. But um, the, 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 the thing here to, to look at is, um, remember I said that it applies roll first, then pitch, then yaw. So let's see if I can get this right. So if I, if I, if I try to do a roll going back and forth like this, if I then do a pitch of 90 degrees, I could be then applying a yaw, right? Um, and that would be the same rotation. So whatever I could have accomplished with the roll, I can pitch 90 degrees and accomplish the same thing with the yaw. So I have a, a singularity in the mapping. Hey, we're robotics people, right? We love singularities in, 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 in mappings, right? Uh, no, usually we don't, right? Um, definitely don't like it in manipulator kinematics and such. Same kind of thing here. So um, I don't really want to use yaw pitch roll. It's very convenient for, for transforming the, the robot, if I'm making a, a simulation animation, even doing dynamics or something, maybe it's fine. Although in control also it causes trouble. Um, I want to use another parameterization. So instead of using all those sines and cosines and, um, and um, using out pitch roll, I'm going to switch to this one, which puts polynomials in my matrix. That's the three by three rotation matrix. Two good things are happening here. One of these is it's going to be an almost bijection. So it's going to be very nice mapping. But another good thing is that polynomials appear here, and that makes algorithm people happy. So it turns out polynomials are better to work with than, um, than sines and cosines um, for certain reasons, which maybe will become clear in the, in the next part after the break. Um, so let's suppose we pick four real numbers, A, B, C, D, but I do add a constraint. This is the only bummer about this one is that the constraint is that A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared equals 1. So that looks like a what? A three-dimensional sphere embedded in R4. And there's four coordinates here, A, B, C, D. Um, so if I do this, it can be shown that um, this mapping here is 2 to 1 going from this SO3, which is a set of all rotations. Hopefully I defined that. Maybe I didn't, but it's um, SO3 is a set of all 3D rotation matrices. And if I pick any A, B, C coordinates, that A, B, C, D coordinates that satisfy this constraint, then I will get a rotation matrix that's valid. And furthermore, every possible rotation over here that I could make by just plugging in whatever real numbers I want as long as they satisfy the SO3 constraints of a rotation matrix, um, there will be two different possibilities of A, B, C, D over here that will give me that matrix. And it turns out that the two that give you the same representation, it's two to one because I could multiply all these by negative one. And if you want to, you know, if we had time, we could work out the algebra. I could just substitute it in 
uh, minus A, minus B, minus C, and minus D for all the variables here, and it will give you the same matrix. So, so that's all that happens. So unfortunately, it's the best we can do. It's 2 to 1. By the way, that constraint A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared equals 1, um, when I went back here, what did I do? I used, I used this transformation here. I can imagine this is like A and this is like B. And to put it on the unit circle, I have A squared plus B squared equals 1, right? So it's kind of like we just went up two more dimensions. Even though we, our space, the workspace, only went up one dimension, why did we go up two dimensions? Because the set of all rotations right, is, is two dimensions higher, right? Because you have three degrees of rotational freedom in three dimensions where you only had one in the plane. All right, now there's a nice geometric interpretation of this, which you know, is fine. It's nice, it helps with implementations and other things. So it turns out that um, every 3D rotation can be expressed about, as a rotation through the origin with some particular line um, that um, is the rotation axis, and it's some angle about that line. And because of the, the, the multiple representations that occur because um, these are actually the ABCD parameters, what they correspond to for that rotation through the origin. And because I can just take this vector V and, and negate it and then do 2 pi minus theta, it's the same rotation. So that's, again, another way to visualize the 2 to 1. A lot of people, when they study ro robotics and motion planning, they may get hung up for a long time on quaternion algebra. Turns out it has really nothing to do here. But it's not really important. All I'm saying is there's a parameterization of the group of rotations that was done with ABCD. If you like quaternion algebra, go have fun with it. Um, in computer graphics and other, maybe for a different FASTA kinematic calculations and such, people like to use the algebra because it involves less multiplications than the original matrices did. So it's, it's convenient for that. But for motion planning, we have much bigger problems to deal with, like collision detection, so we don't really care. So, so, so all we're really using in motion planning is the fact that you can use A, B, C, D to nicely parameterize the matrices. So that's something to pay attention to. If, you get, if you're drowning in the details of quaternion algebra and you don't care, which happens to a lot of my, my, my colleagues sometimes, they, 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 they will go back to using the off-pitch roll. But, but really, um, um, this is, this is um, it's not that bad to work with. You don't have to do any of the quaternion algebra stuff. All right, well, let's think about it now. Okay, so what exactly does this look like? Well, I told you that SO3 now is this sphere, which I call S3. That's the set of all points in R4 that satisfy this constraint, right? But I have a problem that, um, um, what is it? I have a problem. It's not just S3 exactly because, as I said, opposite points are the same. So opposite points on the sphere, these are called antipodal points. They represent the same, right? So um, where's the antipodal point from here? Anybody know? Any local people? Doesn't every, lo every person know the antipodal point from their hometown? No, good. Anyway, I have no idea either. And uh, maybe it's in the Indian Ocean somewhere. I'm not sure. Um, but but um, um, if, if, if you take the antipodal point um, on the Earth and compare it to this one, those would be the same if this were S2. But it's S3 that we're worried about. It's one dimension higher. But same idea. So let's think about what the space of all transformations looks like. Um, let's see, where am I at? I got lost. Let's see. Oh, yeah, I was on this slide. That's right. OK, so I'm on S3. That's this um, three-dimensional sphere. The surface itself is three-dimensional, and it's in four-dimensional space. So I don't know if you call it a 3D sphere or a 4D sphere. You can decide for yourself. Um, how to represent it? Well, I want to start doing homeomorphisms now. I want to do some transformations that don't screw up the manifold. This is where I, I dragged you through some of this stuff. So one of the first things I can do is I can just project down. I can say, well, um, why don't I just use the upper half? Because we don't need the southern hemisphere, right? Uh, no offense to people who live in the southern hemisphere. I don't mean any comparisons to the Earth here. But you know, um, we don't need the southern hemisphere because of this identification. In the, in the actual Earth, we don't have that. Um, so I'll just say that um, I'll just use the, the upper coordinates, and then just uh, A, B, C, D is fine. And I will just project down to the d equals 0 plane. So again, if there was one dimension less, I would be projecting down to the equatorial plane, right? I can name any place on the northern hemisphere by two coordinates, right? Just using x, y coordinates. And then if z was like your height above the equatorial plane, I can just project down into the equatorial plane, right? So that's what that looks like. Very simple transformation. I'm doing anything crazy. Um, and then what do I end up with? Well. If I'm in the equatorial plane, if this had been the actual Earth, that would be a two-dimensional disk, right? If I intersect the equatorial plane with the Earth, I would get a two-dimensional disk, correct? Right? Here, I get a three-dimensional disk, because I'm one dimension higher. So here's my three-dimensional disk. It's unit 
So that's one way to make this look, but I still have this darn identification problem. When I go over to the equator, the opposites are still the same. So now I have, imagine, a solid three-dimensional ball, but the opposite points are the same, and the antipodal points are the same. That's another way to look at it. Um, I, can, I can stretch that out now. So I can take, this is supposed to be a three-dimensional ball. I didn't draw it too nicely. Um, and I didn't go to art school or anything, so sorry about that. But I, I can take this and I can, I can just, being a topologist, I can just pull these, the corners out so that it fills a, a cube. So I can imagine now that the way the configuration space looks is a three-dimensional cube, except, again, the opposite points on the cube are identified. And so that looks very much like, if I go back to this example I had when I showed you the different flat manifolds, let me go back a bit here. Um, remember, this projective space here, that's a square with the opposite points being identified. That's RP2. It turns out that the space of all three-dimensional rotations is just RP3. It's just one dimension higher. And it's represented as a flat. If I want to make it flat, then it's just a cube with opposite points identified. So you actually don't even have to do anything complicated. If you want to do some kind of searching or planning on the space of rotations, if you like, you can map it all to a cube. And then it looks pretty nice, right? You just make your, your coordinates. You have XYZ coordinates on that. And you just have to know what happens when you get to the boundary, right? You have very simple rules of where to jump to. It's like you teleport to some other place on the other side of the cube. And that's all. Right. Um, there's another way to look at it, which is, um, I think, very nice. This is done in, in uh, John Canney's thesis back in the 80s. Um, but um, I could have just, an alternative to that is just take the original S3 and just stretch it out to make the surface of a four-dimensional cube. How many faces does a four-dimensional cube have? How many faces does a three-dimensional cube have? Six, right? Again, I'm not doing anything weird. How many faces does a two-dimensional cube have? Four, right? Is a four, so then you have six faces. So in four dimensions, you have eight faces. So there's eight three-dimensional faces. It turns out because of opposite points being the same, you only need four of those. So all you got to do is pick four uh, faces of the four-dimensional cube. Each face is three-dimensional. So you get three cubes that are glued together. That's another way to do it. So, um, um, so you have multiple representations. Um, there are some trade-offs in these. And you can start to see the trade-offs when you get to what's called metric spaces, which is coming next. Any questions about this? All right, so, so that's what it looks like. And if I now combine everything, I get RP3. That's what I get for rotations. And that's what I get for translations. I get now a six-dimensional configuration space for a free-floating rigid body. Um, if I have chains of bodies, then I just use Cartesian product and glue them on. Like, for example, for this link, I get R2 cross S1, and we'll put that link in any configuration. If this one can swing around any angle, I get an S1 for that. And if this one can swing around, I get an S1 for that. So that's how that looks. Um, if I have closed kinematic chains, well, I'm, I'm in a little more trouble, because um, um, how do I know which configurations actually keep the chain closed? Right? I can specify angles for all of these, but I have an initial constraint. You can write out the constraint with polynomials, if you like, because we have polynomial parameterizations, even in three dimensions, as I said. That becomes a problem that's um, studied in algebraic geometry. People like to study the structure of roots of multivariate polynomials. And there's a branch of that called computational real algebraic geometry, where people characterize exactly the topology of, of these collections, of, of these, um, um, let's say, collection of polynomials and what are the roots. They characterize the topology of the zero set and, um, well, it's a very hard problem in general. And uh, what we need to do motion planning work is a nice parameterization. Right? I, I gave you nice parameterizations of, of describing exactly what parameters to vary um, for, for rigid bodies. I'm not doing it for this. There are some nice works. If you're interested in this topic, you can look at some references in my book, or I can give you some uh, newer references, for example, um, on that. All right, let's see. Um, all right, so. We start to compare representations, and I, I prefer convenient parameterizations. Um, and um, by the way, my parameters might lie on a circle. That's OK, too. That's usually not the definition of parameterization in, in, um, in calculus, but it's OK. And um, I want to minimize the amount of geometric distortion. So what exactly does that mean? Well, in order to even talk about distortion, I now need to think about metric spaces. And that goes 
beyond topology. That's starting to look like geometry now. So, before, so far, it was only topology. I could not detect stretching, right? We could take the interval and stretch it out to make the real numbers. Nothing got further away because there was no way to measure further. Well, now I bring in a metric. And we are going to care about that in some motion planning algorithms, especially sampling-based ones, which I will cover in the next part. So what is a metric space? Um, I'm sure many of you have seen this before. I just start with a topological space, and now I add a function of two variables. So I just take two points in my space, and I want to have something that looks like distance. That's all. Just a distance function is another word for the metric. Right? You can see metric looks also like the word geometry. Right? It has the word metric inside of it. Um, what does isometric mean? Right? Preserves distance. Things like that. OK. It um, has to be non-negative. I don't like negative distances. I only want the distance to be 0 if I'm, in fact, looking at the same point twice. Um, symmetry. Um, now, in control systems, you, you have a lot of systems that break symmetry, right? It may be more expensive to drive my car up the hill than drive down the hill, right? And so you may see asymmetric metrics coming up. But here, I just mean symmetric. And the triangle inequality, that's a good one. That essentially says that there's some inherent optimality built into the metric, right? If I look at the distance from um, A to C, I should not be able to reduce that distance by going through B. That would be a little bit weird, right? So you should not be able to, to save. It should be, uh, the, the, the distance from A to C should, in some sense, be optimal. It should be the best way to get from A to C. Um, so you may have seen LP metrics. You can use Euclidean distance and RN, or uh, Manhattan metrics, or L infinity metrics, all stuff like that. Um, what does that mean exactly? I probably should have at least put one slide on LP metrics, but. Um, I can just take the magnitude of the, of, I can just look at the difference in coordinates for each coordinate, take the absolute value of all of those and add them up. That would be an L1 metric. Or I can look at the maximum coordinate difference across all coordinates. That's L infinity. Euclidean is just L2. All right. Um, it's good. I think I'm okay on time. Listen, I'm going to stop at about 10.15, I think, and I've got to make sure I have time for my homework problem that you'll have to do during the coffee break. Um, all right, so distance is SO2. Well, that's really easy. What are my distances on the circle? I can just look at the coordinates. Remember, this is a set of all rotations now, the group of all rotations. I can just look at the distance in R2. So one thing you can do is you can just inherit the metric from Rm, that higher dimensional space that we set all our manifolds are embedded in. You can just use it directly if you want, as long as you did not perform these weird identifications, and you've got to be careful. Right, so I can just use that. That's fine. I embedded the circle nicely, so I can use that. Um, another way to do it is to actually look at the angle difference, which um, then actually looks at, the, in some sense, the distance traveled along the circle or is proportional to that. Um, you can do it with a min here. You've got to take care of the, the 2 pi minus problem because in the endpoints. Um, this is very nice, right? You remember taking the um, take two dimensional vectors, right? And you take the inner product or dot product equal to the cosine of theta. So based on that, I can use cosine inverse. And that will just give me the distance in angles. The reason why I put this is because um, it's going to be helpful for the quaternion case, or sorry, the um, SO3 case, which is coming in a moment. Um, note that when I use A and B here, I mean this parameterization that we've used before. So if I want to um, compare distances in SO3, I can do the same thing. Remember that that looks like a point on the three-dimensional sphere in R4. And so I can just do this. And that will give me the angle between them. That gives me a very nice metric on SO3. Um, I can make other metrics because you know, if we've been thinking with homeomorphism, we can re-parameterize, we can transform these spaces and represent them in many different ways, right? So if I can do that, then um, what are the different possibilities, right? And, and how do they relate? Well, one thing that's going to be very important is a really nice idea uh, called Haar measure. Um, that's just something probably less people know about me, but I, I, really, I, really, I really like it a lot. So this applies in a very general setting. I think the highest one is any um, uh, locally compact topological group, but that includes all of this stuff. It includes the Lie groups that we use in robotics and such. So, so SON, SEN, no problem. Here's the idea. I have measure. In other words, a notion of volume or area um, or length, if you're in one dimension. In the, in the plane, same, the same thing you use to do calculus. It can be probability measure if you want. And um, the Haar measure needs to be invariant with respect to the transformations that this group allows. So here's a very simple example. If I decide to represent SO2 by the circle, here's a set of, so, so this is an interval, let's say. Just look at this interval. This is a set of possible rotations, right? 
what happens if I apply a rotation to that set? Right? So I can do that, right? Uh, the, the group acts on the manifold. I can, if I apply a rotation to that, it jumps over there, right? Does its length change? Right? Its length does not change, and that's very nice. If I had represented this circle instead as a triangle, then the length might change when I apply a rotation to it. So what's nice here is that this representation and this notion of length is a hard measure. And to me, that's very strongly uniform. You know, you've gotten like the right, let's say, uniform representation and metric for that. No matter where I go, I can apply a rotation to this. And it doesn't depend on my origin here. Whatever I decided to be zero, the, the chunk of rotations that I use around this, or the set of rotations that I use around this, if I move it somewhere else, it's the same area, or volume, or measure, or length in this case. That's a very nice property to have, especially if you're doing, let's say, probabilistic sampling and such, which we'll talk about a little later. So, so it's a very good property to have. Um, what's Am I going to go a little bit? Oh, okay. Let's see. Oh, yeah. One more thing I wanted to say about that is that um, I thought I said. Okay, I'm missing a slide, maybe. But um, um, one thing I wanted to say is that um, the reason why I brought this up, um, which I forgot a slide on, is um, if you use the sphere S3 to represent your your set of rotations. Um, let's go to. Um, let see. That's two dimensions. Yeah. Here. Sorry. So if we talk about SO3 and I have this, these four parameters A, B, C, D. And if I use this as my metric, um, which has to take into account the antipolar points, but again, if I take my point on this sphere, remember the sphere is an R4, it's a three-dimensional sphere. If I just look at a ball of points that, and look at the volume of that, that respects the Haar measure. So I just want to say that that representation of SO3 on the sphere S3 is, let's say, beautiful and perfect. It has exactly kind of what you want. It's the most undistorted representation you can make. I just say it's a very nice thing. So that if I talk about a chunk of rotation matrices and then I rotate that chunk somewhere, it still has the same volume. So any kind of sampling method you make then will be invariant to any particular, um, whatever you decided to be the, the, the origin. Um, usually the origin of the rotation group is um, the identity matrix, but whatever you like, you can apply a transformation, transform everything. The volume is invariant. It's a very nice property to have. That's the reason why I put up the hard measure slide, but I forgot to mention the 3D case there. Um, all right. Well, we have to compare rotations to translations. That often becomes a problem of, let's say, comparing apples to oranges. Um, and uh, we have metrics that may compare the translation parts and a metric that compares the rotation part. And we can combine them with some coefficients, if you like. I can also square them and add them up and take the square root, make it look Euclidean-like, whatever you like. Those will all make valid metrics, by the way. There's a theorem, there's a theorem that says that will work um, for any LP metric. You can do any kind of LP combination and still get a metric. But um, it's very interesting to think about. If I have a really long robot, like say a ladder, and I do a tiny rotation, the end of the ladder moves a lot, right? So when I start combining rotation and translational parts, it's important to try to pay attention to the sensitivity of some parts that are really far away. So if we were to represent it in polar coordinates, if some point is very far away, has a very long radius, that's going to become important when you, when you combine these components. I may give more weight to uh, the rotation component. All right. Um, configuration space optimals. So I'll spend a few minutes on that, and then, um, and then I will give your homework assignments for the coffee break, and then we'll come back at 10.45. Um, so this is a serious class. Um, I forgot to hire a grader, darn it. I can't grade things myself anymore. Well, no, let, 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 let's, let's see what happens. All right, so given a world, and a, um, we have an optical region that's closed, and we have a, a robot that's closed, and uh, we have a configuration space, so we define the space of transformations now. I want to talk about placing the robot in different configurations. That's A of Q. I'm going to have this thing called the obstacle region. We call it C ops. It's the intersection of the set that the robot occupies in the world and the obstacles. I look at the intersection. If that's not empty, that means the robot is touching or completely overlapping with some portion of the obstacles. Um, that, by the way, is a closed set because I define all of these to be closed. I will end up with a closed set for the optical region. You can think about that if you like. We can um, go through arguments that during the break, maybe. Um, and then the complement is going to be an open set, naturally, because that's the way these work, because this is all a topological space that we started with. Um, so the complement, C free, is an open set. And that's the place where we want to keep the robot. Right? We don't like the robots in collision. 
Well, it depends, depends on your goals. goals. And some people want to make robots that the goal may be to collide. Bulldozing robots fun. All right. Well, one thing that's very important when we start off with planar robots is the Minkowski sum. So if I, if I look at an obstacle, um, this I, I stole from the, the Seagal manual. It's a very nice library, by the way, of computational geometry uh, algorithms that have been implemented very cleanly and neatly. Um, and it's uh, open source, available, it's really cool stuff. It's open source of some kind. I, I can't remember all the constraints on it. I don't know if it's also for industry or not. Um, but look it up, nice. Um, and um, so the Minkowski sum, I basically just take, if I have two sets, x and y, or p and q in this picture, I just add up all, I pick all pairs of points and just add their coordinates. So if I do that for these two sets, it makes this complicated one that a computational geometer would naturally think of. And you know, there's some holes left in there. Um, that turns out to be very important for making obstacle regions. So for example, this is the um, Minkowski difference. You can get the Minkowski difference by just negating the second set if you want. So I can just take all the points in the second set and just negate them. Or I can just define it separately like this, so just take x minus y. And here's how we get the, the, the obstacle region. Here's a one-dimensional example. If I have a one-dimensional robot here, it's just an interval from negative 1 to 2, and I have this obstacle, clearly it's in collision the way I've drawn it here, right? I just take negative a, and then I look at all cases where I slide this back and forth, right? where I slide negative a back and forth, and where will it still touch the obstacle, right? Um, now, what is going on here? Remember that, and this is very, very important, I, I know students mess this up a lot, is that the, the optical region is, a, is, is defined in the configuration space, not in the, in the, in the workspace of the world. That becomes very important. So it's a set of possible transformations. So this is what the robot looks like when it's at zero. This is what the robot looks like when it's been negated. But, 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 but let's forget about the negation for a minute. That's just for the computation. If I take this robot and I move it down, how far do I have to move it down to where it's barely touching this? I move it down, what, two steps? So that's a transformation of negative 2. Well, look, that's right where this configuration space optical ends, right, negative 2. If I move this up, it goes right up to the place where, how many positions do I have to move it up? I move it up five spaces, and that's exactly where it stops touching this. That's here. Right? So the observation here of, of the Minkowski difference is just that I can alternatively just negate A and then take the Minkowski uh, sum between these two and I, when I pull all the points together, it gives me the configuration space optimal. So just be aware that even though we're drawing them all in the same space here, this one, the Oxy Ops really lives in a different space. It's, it's a configuration space optical. You can superimpose them for, um, um, for these simple examples, but for more complicated spaces, you cannot. They have different dimensions, right? For example, the configuration space for a rigid body in three dimensions is six dimensional, so you can. But for these examples, you can. That's nice, but it leads to confusion. So here's a nice way to look at the configuration space obstacle. Um, I, take, I take the robot here, and um, I look at all of the configurations that would cause it to touch the obstacle. One way to view that is just by sliding the robot around the boundary. Just look at the different cases. Um, one thing that's interesting about that is if I look at um, what makes the optical parts here, I get a very nice um, algorithm. So when I slide around, I alternate between a vertex of the obstacle touching an edge of the robot and a vertex of the robot touching an edge of the obstacle. That's what alternates as you move around. So at least it's a very cute uh, algorithm where I look at the inward normals of the robot, the outward normals of the obstacle, I sort them, and then I just construct the obstacle region by just putting together the pieces as if I had taken apart these, as, imagine these are made out of uh, out of Tinker Toys or Legos or something, I just I pull them apart the edges and I just reassemble them. They reassemble to make the configuration space obstacle, and the order in which to reassemble them is given exactly by this ordering of the normals. So if you look at this carefully, you can see the edges of the robot, right? Here's one edge, right? Over there. Here's an up, this short edge here comes from this of the robot. These two long edges come up here and here. And the four sides of the rectangle you see there, right? So it's very nice. So it's just you assemble the configuration space optical from that. Um, we can get exactly the coordinates of it, which um, I don't want to go into the details of it, but um, I, I, students are always messing this up a lot, it turns out, because they, they forget that this is all in the space of transformations. That's the thing to keep, keep track of. Um, so what happens with when we get a little bit higher? 
Uh, well, when we get up into um, higher dimensions, um, we have uh, we allow rotation, then we can look at all the ways that, let's say, a vertex of the optical can touch an edge of the robot, and a vertex of the robot can touch an edge of the optical. That depends on x, y, and theta now, right? And it's a two-dimensional set of, you know, if, if I maintain the contact point, I get a two-dimensional set of possibilities. So it gets quite a bit more complicated to describe this, but I just want to point out that because we can parameterize all of the, the rotations here with just the A, B, C, D, so the A, B parameters in the 2D case, then we end up with uh, algebraic constraints to satisfy these, these contacts. And then we end up with a piecewise algebraic representation for the configuration space optical. So it's not too hard to write all this out. And uh, unfortunately, the combinatorics makes lots and lots of cases. And that's the thing that gets difficult. But it, it's doable. It has been done before. And you end up with a semi-algebraic representation, which is why I mentioned that in the beginning. 3D case, same thing. You just have three different cases. Each one of these contributes to make, I guess these are making five-dimensional surface patches of the configuration space obstacle. And each one of these five-dimensional surface patches has an algebraic representation. Uh, let's see, I'm about out of time. I want to make sure I get to my homework problem. Um, if you have a manipulator, then it gets even more complicated, right? If a, just a two-link robot makes very complicated obstacles in the obstacle region there. Um, we finally have enough to state the basic motion planning problem, which I'll remind you of after the break. But let me make sure I, um, more details in my book, let me make sure I do the homework problem. And then we'll take a, we'll take a break until uh, 1045. So um, we have a car that drives on a gigantic sphere, all right? Now, this is not a higher dimensional sphere. This is a big sphere like, um, like we maybe pretend the Earth looks like, okay? So, so I have a very big sphere, and I'm driving the car around, and there's no mountains, no oceans. It's a perfectly um, you know, smooth, flat, well, flat but very low curvature, let's say, in reality, uh, sphere. The car doesn't wobble or anything. So then I put a car down, and, and it, can, it can drive anywhere on the Earth. I just want to know what's the configuration space. Um, in order to make sure you're thinking correctly, I'll already say that it, it, I just mean it has, it has three degrees of freedom. Right? I, I take this car and drive around. The car doesn't have extra wobbling that it does at a point. Right? The car sits flatly on the earth, but we can drive around anywhere on it. What's the configuration space of the car? All right, so that's the homework problem, and um, I'll continue at uh, 1045.